live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Micron Insight 2018. Brought to you by Micron. Welcome back to San Francisco Bay, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante, and I'm here with my co-host, David Floyer. We're covering Micron Insight 2018. Really bringing together memory, storage, and artificial intelligence, talking about AI for good, talking about changing the way in which we work, new workloads. Raj Talori is here, he's the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Micron's booming yeah. mobile business unit. Raj, I think it's the fastest growing business unit at, at Micron, at least of size. And Keith Crescent is here, he's, the senior vice, he's a Senior Vice President at Qualcomm. Keith, welcome. Thank Gentlemen, you. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Our pleasure. Thank you. So Raj, let's, let's start with you. What are the big trends that you see that are driving that at 60% growth rate in your business? Yeah, I mean, we are finding now that uh, you know, mobile phones and the use of uh, memory in mobile phones, and uh, this is DRAM, and also use of storage in mobile phones, this is where we actually, you know, like uh, flash. Uh, both are growing inside a mobile phone. Uh, you know, we've seen people launch, uh, you know, four and six gigabyte phones, and now we have our customers talking about eight and 10 and 12 gigabyte phones in the future. And one of the big reasons is the applications. You know, uh, a lot of uh, machine learning and AI applications in the phones, and those are driving the need for uh, a lot of increased uh, both storage and memory. Mm. Keith, so we'll talk about what's changing in your business over the last several years. I mean, mobile obviously exploded onto the scene, um, but now people are talking about AI in mobile and mobile and, and just increased use cases and applications, so what's going on from your perspective? Yeah, I think from a handset perspective, there's been some uh, visual changes, right? The screens got a little bigger, the bezels get smaller, uh, phones get a little thinner, and so you see some of the visual cues, um, but really the excitement of what's going on underneath the visual cues. So the amount of AI processing is accelerating at a rapid pace, uh, a lot of advanced uh, cameras, you know, moving from two, three, four, and now there's phones with five cameras, uh, cameras that recognize depth perception. Uh, there's a voice recognition. Uh, so there's a lot of AI processing and a lot of capability getting into the phone for a variety of applications. So okay, so voice recognition, that makes sense. You'd use AI for that. But you're talking about a AI in, in visual in, in, in the, the handset. Talk more about that. W explain how that all works. Yeah, so, so actually I would argue that today imaging is probably the primary application of AI. So mm. cameras used to be just capturing pixels, but now it's about much more than capturing pixels, it's about understanding what those pixels are. So are they recognizing uh, objects or food or something else, or is it facial recognition for things like payments and biometrics? Mm -hmm. And so the cameras now are much more in intelligent. And with multiple cameras, you're adding depth information, uh, so then you start to get to uh, much lev higher levels of realism uh, for things like avatar and gaming and other uh, areas where the, the camera's capturing and also perceiving. So not, not a hot dog for you fans of the show, <laughs> Silicon Valley. Uh, so, but Raj, what does this all mean for the, the memory and storage requirements? Yeah, I mean, as Keith mentioned, I think uh, you know the mobile phone, you know, with the process from Qualcomm and uh, and uh, other processor vendors, has really gotten to have a lot more camera applications and a lot more AI applications. Now, there's a there's a difference when you actually drive applications that need AI and machine learning versus other applications, uh, and the difference is that. Um, the p compute paradigm in AI and ML is different in the sense that these are like complex neural networks that need a lot of, lot of data very close to the processor to achieve this result. So as more AI applications come in, uh, we are actually finding that the customers, which are Qualcomm's customers and our customers, are asking for more processing from their side, but they're also asking for more higher speed, higher density memory to, to couple tightly with the processor so they can realize these AI applications for the consumers. And also storage, because sometimes you want to store a lot of the images and videos on the card. So both storage and memory are increasing as these applications mm -hmm. come in. Well, uh, I'd like to ask about the gaming side of things and the, and the AR. That seems to me that it's, it's starting to improve to a, to a level which is frightening in near reality. What do you have to do to get it to that stage where you can have true VR and have games, for example, which exploit that? Sure, so maybe first I'll talk about gaming specifically. Um, gaming obviously continues to grow, a lot of money in gaming, gaming tournaments and so forth. 
The gaming certainly is getting more real, realistic with better graphics and so forth, uh, better displays. Uh, multiplayer gaming, very hot. Right, multiplayer gaming requires you know very fast connections, very low latency connections to another source, so player, multiple players can play at the same time. Also, many times for games, you'll have a uh, play with partners. Maybe you're on a team of five, but uh, now and coming soon, maybe that team of five, you don't need to find that fifth person or that fourth person. Maybe there's an AI <laughs> uh, engine that's running similar to the human capability, <laughs> and you're actually playing with a simulated player, right, from teams. So there's, and that require, opens up a whole new area yep. of processing for the games. And then I think for AR and VR, AR is a little further out than VR. AR requires some more advancements with respect to optics and so forth. VR is taking you know, high-end displays and AI and graphics, kind of packaging it all into one to really change the paradigm of how you interact with the computer. How does 5G change things? Is it, is it as much of a game changer as people think? or is there just so much data that it sort of allows us to keep pace? I wonder if you could talk about 5G. Yeah, so, so you know, every 10 years or so, there's a G transition. 3G in 99, 4G in 2009, now 5G in 2019. So it's on a 10-year cadence. And every time when you have a G transition, you couple that with a transition in uh, computing and it changes the paradigm. So what's going to happen is 5G is going to bring a lot more capacity, a lot lower latency, at the same time AI is coming in. And that together is going to create a pretty powerful platform for applications for the future. And then of course there's just so much more data right. now. How do you guys keep up? Because the you mentioned, you know, you've been talking you know, to, the, to the street and you mentioned this morning that the, the rate of, of bit density is, yep. is, is moderating. So how do you guys keep up? Where, where are your investments uh, that allow you to keep pace? Yeah, I mean we have, uh, so, so just maybe a little bit of comment on 5G. I think as the <laughs> bandwidth to the device gets faster and faster, mm -hmm. there's more and more data that comes in. Like you, you can imagine, for example, one of the things people, a lot of people like to do you know, is to um, you know, download content. If you look at Netflix, if you look at Amazon Prime, if you look at even DirecTV, and I have all of those, you can actually download the content now and watch them offline. So as it happens, and that content gets to be 4K and, and even higher frame rates, the amount of storage that's needed to download that is getting more and more. Like, you know, you know my wife upgraded her phone the other day, and the first thing she said is, I want the entire Netflix season on my phone when I'm in the gym. <laughs> so, so, you know, the simple things like that have changed a lot. You know, that's one of the reasons why the storage is getting so much. Now, when you go to 5G and the download speed gets higher, you can download like a 4K video really quickly. Now you got to put it somewhere after you download it. So that's actually driving the need for this. Uh, so before, people wouldn't like download a 4K video because where would you put it? So as we increase storage, that kind of stuff comes really fast because you couldn't you know, take a long time to download before. So as the bandwidth gets higher, the storage requirements and the memory requirements are getting higher. Yeah. What we are doing on that front is we are investing a lot, you know, as uh, Sanjay and uh, Scott talked earlier, uh, both in our fab capacities, both in our technology transitions. We have a lot of new interesting technologies like new emerging memories that actually, like 3D Crosspoint we talked about, that kind of blur the line between uh, storage and memory. So there's a lot of new interesting technologies that will actually take advantage of that. Super exciting time. So uh, um, going back to the image processing side of that, one of the trends it seems to me is that uh, the processing is going further and further to the edge itself and going inside the camera itself. Can you talk a little bit about that and what it's going to take to to put that that your memory technology or bandwidth right inside the camera itself? Sure. So so there's no doubt that you want to maximize the capability on the edge as a first step, and then you want to reduce the latency as much as possible to the cloud as a second step. So on the edge, you know, if if you had something, for example, if I'm taking a picture of you and I want face recognition, I don't want to take every frame and send it up to the cloud, no, right? Because no I'm going to yeah. waste bandwidth. Yeah. So I want at, I want that capability on device, yeah. and that's true for a variety of different applications. You want to maximize the capability on device and then focus on the fast connection. So the cloud and the device, from a latency and bandwidth perspective, are are much tightly more tightly coupled. Yeah. You know, when you think about the evolution of computing. You know, obviously everything was centralized, and then you know, PCs, the world was about PCs back then. It was kind of, the, the centralization mm -hmm. was a bit blip on the screen mm -hmm. compared to the PCs was everything, you right. remember that. And then of course, mobile drove cloud through the roof, and now with the edge and cloud and, and mobile, you're seeing just this ubiquitous capability that senses, now you bring in AI, you bring in machine intelligence, uh, it, it, 
what do you guys envision for the, for the next 10 years in terms of what the world looks like? <laughs> Centralized, decentralized, distributed, intelligent, I mean, it's just mind boggling. What, what, yeah. What's your vision? Well, I think if you look at client devices, Client devices certainly generate a lot of data. Mm. Maybe we get a little bit of data from a sensor and a bridge, but maybe we get a lot of data from the car traveling across that bridge. And what you need to do is you need to make sense of that data locally and then transmit it back to the cloud. So you want the cloud to have the most useful data or sorted data, right? Data that can then improve, you know, uh, uh, automated driving, reduce traffic accidents and so forth, but you don't want all the data sent there. So what's going to happen is on the edge, there's literally you know, devices going from smartphones where there's about one and a half billion a year to billions and even trillions of IOT connected devices. Any device that has a computing element also is going to have a connectivity element, also is going to have an AI element. So it's going to be a much more connected world as opposed to just connected people. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so I think Keith, Keith explained it uh, very, very well. You know, uh, you know, if you step back a little bit, I think the the history of technology and uh, evolution has been very similar, right? You know, having been in the industry for a while, we, we all remember the times when we said we just need one one mainframe and everyone needs dumb terminals, right? Then we went on to say, hey, you know what? I think distributed computing with everyone having a PC is the right thing to do. Now we are back to maybe we should have everything in the cloud and the edge devices. So I actually think you know, world goes cyclical and the more you do at the edge, the more it drives the need for the cloud, and we call it the virtuous cycle. And I think the best way to think about it is you want the edge devices to send information, not data. Which means they need to be, right. data needs to be processed with memory and compute to become information, and then you send the information to the edge, to the cloud. Yeah, and I guess my point was that, you know, I've been around a while too, and you right. see the pendulum swing. Right. I feel like the pendulum is not swinging anymore, it's just exploding. <laughs> it's both sides, that's right. It's just, right. Of, it's, just it's, it's really an exciting right. time in our right. industry. Guys, thanks very right. much for coming on. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. All right, keep it right there everybody. We'll be back at Micron Insight from the Embarcadero. You're watching theCUBE, right back.